my name is David Pinsky. My administrative role, I happen to serve as the chief of cardiovascular medicine at the University of Michigan. I'm a co-head of the Frankel Cardiovascular Center. You're listening to Interview with the Surgeon with the Surgeon Agent. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Interview with the Surgeon. Today, we welcome Dr. David Pinsky, Chief of Cardiovascular Medicine at University of Michigan. Doc, how are we doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. Thanks for being with us. So let's just jump right into it. What were your goals and aspirations during your residency, and how did those change during your fellowship? So, uh, well, as a first-year resident, you're, you're called an intern, and uh, the first goal was to prima no notre, first do no harm, to, to not kill anybody. That was my first early goal, to know everything that I could um, to make sure I, I served as a patient's agent and, and to not hurt them. And um, that was early. Um, and then along the way, uh, the, the goal became more strategic and broader. Um, frankly, honestly, now, how, how do we change the field to make it better for patients? Maybe patients you don't see, patients beyond the reach of your own stethoscope. Well, between residency and fellowship, it's all a continuous stream of training. And so I, I would say the mentality doesn't change. Once you've selected the field that, that you're interested in specializing in, training is training and there's a, a prescribed path. And, and so there's really not a different mindset, I would say, between residency and fellowship. And then even uh, for cardiology, there's subspecialty fellowship, um, for instance, which I, I, I did. I'm a, a nuclear cardiologist as a subspecialist. Um, but um, the, the real change, I think the, the, the pivot point is when you leave the training period and the decisions you make are your own. You don't have an attending physician over you um, to, be, to be that voice or to be the signature underneath your own. Um, you are the buck stops here. And um, psychologically, that's a big deal. Um, and, and so that, I think, is the transition point, going either into a practice, as some do, or into an academic environment. When you become the attending physician, as we call it, um, that's, a, that's a big deal. Can you kind of take us through your last year of your fellowship and what your mentality was like heading into your first job search and how that perspective changed in the beginning years of your career? My first job search was, um, I was in a big city. I was in New York City. Um, and it's a very, it's a highly competitive environment. Um, I was very focused personally on an academic uh, path. There are many opportunities, even uh, plenty along the way to, to, to join practices, either, either as a full-time or, ev or on the side. Uh, many, many opportunities, but I, I was a little bit like that horse with blinders, where I really, I really had um, something I wanted to accomplish in the research field. And, and so to do that, I really stuck closely uh, to academic environment. Um, so my, my job search was limited to academia. And um, even, even though, um, you know, it's like a siren call, uh, there are practice opportunities aplenty. There were then, there are now um, for a well-trained uh, individual and, and coming from a good program. And so, um, I really had to keep a focus in saying, what do I really want to accomplish with my life? And for me, I wanted to at least try to, to, to change my field and try to make it better for those with heart disease um, through research. On that thought, did you ever consider going private practice throughout your career? Uh, well, the answer is I, I love seeing patients. And so, so I have to be honest, yes, I think everybody does. Um, uh, you, you know, when we go into medicine, I think we're, we're all thinking, how do we help people? And I'd say nearly everybody finds it extraordinary. It's a privilege. It's an opportunity. It's satisfying to be able to take care of patients. And so if, if my life turned out to be one where I was taking care of patients um, in a practice environment, I would have loved that career. And so, yes, um, yeah, it wasn't I never dismissed it out of hand because there's always something very attractive about taking care of patients. I, I still do take care of patients. It's just um, in a more limited way uh, because I do other things as well. I think, I think most of us who become doctors um, want to want to minister to people. What would you say were some of the keys to your success that shaped your early career as you climbed the ranks of the academic community? 
I would say that um, my my own career trajectory has really been um, marked by having a lot of people around me who are very supportive. I think that's the case maybe with everybody. Now in my position, I, I advise dozens, pro probably hundreds over, over my career lifetime of people at the fellow to faculty transition point. Uh, I think the, the real key to success is uh, first finding somebody or several people who you want your career to emulate. Um, and so having, having somebody who's a role model is absolutely essential. And you don't always find it in the same person. It could be in, you can have a patient care role model, somebody who has a bedside manner that is, is gentle, it's effective, it's powerful, a communication style you wanna emulate. And you say, boy, I wanna be a doctor like that. And I, I have those people in my lifetime. I, you know, even as I'm telling you, they're in my mind and I say, you know, I don't know if I can live up to that, but boy, that is an aspirational goal. So that would be one type of career model. The other is somebody who maybe has accomplished a great deal and you say, you know what, I, I, wanna, I wanna do what they've done with their lives. And then you, you try to work with these individuals who, whom you respect greatly and deconstruct it. How, what would I need to do in my own lifetime career to become like you have in your career? So I think having role models and mentors um, who, who help honestly tell you, um, tell you where the bumps in the road are. Um, I, I, think, I think there's no substitute for, for finding those individuals. What advice do you have for the graduating residence fellows entering the professional job market for the first time? So I would say that if you're entering the job market for the first time or the second time or, or the 10th time, um, be very, very honest about what you want. I find that, that often my first conversation um, with trainees, um, it's a little bit shy. Like, let's be honest. Um, people have a lot of educational debt. Not all people, but many people. And so one of, one of the things that people are embarrassed about, because we're not taught to talk about money at all. Matter of fact, in our training, um, the idea of being a doctor to make money is, is really, it's not a good thing. It's not something that, that people aspire to. And um, so I, I think it's okay to have an open conversation and, and, and wanting to be comfortable. It's, it's, you know, money's not, it's not a dirty word. It's, so one of the first things I do when I have a conversation with somebody is I say, you know, I'm, I'm setting salaries, I'm talking salaries. I, I talk money to people all the time. I'm very comfortable at this point in my life and my career in doing that. Me, when I was at that stage, no, I, I, don't, I wasn't comfortable at all. I didn't even want to mention the word. Um, but I, I think, so the first advice I would give is know what you want, know what you need. And, um, and if you have to pay back debt, then that's a part of what you need to understand. And the people who are hiring you, I think, I think it's fair to have open and, on, open and honest conversations. So... Uh, money's just one thing, right? There, there are a dozen things. Money's low on the list, but, but, but don't be embarrassed about money uh, because um, it's very real. Uh, I would say another thing is, and probably the most important thing, I probably should have said it first, is be honest what you want in your career. Um, if, if you want to go to a high-powered academic place, ask yourself why. Like, what is the point? Do you really want to run a research lab? Well, if you do, that's fantastic. And then that's where you should strive to go for. But if you really want to go in a practice environment and that's where your heart is, then maybe you don't want to go into the place that publishes the most papers, but maybe you want to go to a residency or a fellowship that, um, that has the most cases. And there's some, some places which are less academic than others that just do case after case after case. Maybe that's what you want. So I think, um, I think you need to get out of the mentality that it's, it's all about the prestige. Because I think prestige matters not, not a lot. Not at all, maybe. Um, it's really about um, getting to where you want to go. If you want to be a high-volume surgeon and a high-volume operator, you've got to go to a place that does a lot of cases. So you learn a lot of procedures. 
you're able to do a lot of procedures. And, and, and frankly, there's a, a lot of volume quality data. We know that the more you do, the better you are. And so that's how you're honest with yourself. If you want to go to a place and get grants and compete for NIH level funding and be able to change the guidelines in practice, well, then you have to go to a place where people are networked, where they're connected, where you have mentors and role models who are doing those things so that they can help lift you up. So that's what I would say. But you got to be really honest about you want what you want. With this year, with a lot of these annual conferences being done virtually and online, what advice do you have for the graduating class regarding their networking and outreaching process? Uh, networking is very tough this year. Um, there's no question. Um, uh, meeting people by Zoom, it, it's different. You know, when, when, you know, I find it difficult because I'm, I'm used to shaking people's hands. I'm used to, um, you know, sort of understanding where they're coming from in sort of a whole person way. It's very hard on Zoom, whether these just sound bites. I, I think that takes a special level of effort. So my advice for you is if you have a first interview, say you have a first Zoom interview, and right now they're all Zoom interviews. Um, for our fellowship program, we just did a whole deck of Zoom interviews just last week. Uh, so we're starting this year's cycle, first time ever by Zoom. Um, it, it is a, a sort of strange and disconnected process. But what I would advise you is if there's something that catches your eye, don't hesitate to, to to go outside that cycle and reach back and say, you know, I really missed that point. Or, you know, in my set of Zoom interviews, I didn't really get to meet Dr. So-and-so. And Dr. So-and-so, you know, I've been reading about Dr. So-and-so, and, and I think I might like to work with Dr. So-and-so. Is there any chance I might be able to meet that person? So I guess I would say, maybe don't always think that you have to stick to the script. And you can ask people, say outside of the context of the formal Zoom time limit zone, maybe you can meet, you could go back and meet somebody. I would say that would be my advice in this strange time. Seeing that you deal with residents and fellows, what are some of the biggest mistakes you see young physicians making when they enter the job market for the first time? I think there's a, a bit too much, first of all, general timidity. There's a timidity nowadays I see to really start something on your own. I would say even a decade ago, people would strike out in solo practice. It's much harder to do now, of course, um, or strike up in situations where there was a bit of uncertainty. And um, nowadays, I think people want more and more certainty. So I think, I think actually it's a creative mistake to think that you're going to know everything about a job before you take it. I think you need to, to, to do a gut check. And if you like the people, most important, is if you like the people you're gonna be working with, whether it's academic or private, you do that gut check. And if you like it and you don't have every detail figured out, don't worry about it because you like the people and you, hopefully you trust the people you're gonna be working with, uh, whether it's your bosses or your, co your future colleagues. And if your gut says it's okay, I would say, you know what? It's okay to just, you know, dive in. That gut check matters. I'll tell you that I'm in a remarkable position and I've had the most best fortune along the way. Um, don't be afraid to see serendipity as I did. You know, I was never going to be an academic leader except for a serendipitous chance meeting. And one thing led to the next. So, um, you know, um, understand that serendipity plays a role in everything and, and be willing to, to seize opportunities that may just appear that you may not have even thought of before. Um, so in my, own, in my own path, it was a chance meeting. I, I gave a lecture in, in a strange environment, and somebody said, hey, were you thinking of this? We're looking for something like this. And I wasn't looking, um, but it was, and it was serendipitous. But I said, hey, you know, let me at least explore it. So um, that was pivotal for me. That was, that was when I was on the faculty at Columbia. Um, and uh, I would just say, um, sometimes those chance meetings are important or those chance events in my research. I had some serendipitous findings, which I wasn't, I wasn't going in a direction, but I followed it. And it led to some really interesting discoveries. Hopefully they're going to change the way we practice. That's, that's a goal of mine. But so um, understand serendipity will play a role in your lives and embrace it. 
We hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.